In this episode, I'll show you a bit of this, and lots of that, and some of this. I'll give you the lowdown on the intricate mechanical features of these microcoaxial low pass filters, and some insights into what's needed to make them work reliably, repeatably, and with the highest possible efficiency. As ever, my artificially intelligent advisor Amy will be providing helpful and encouraging feedback. Amy, have you been tampering with this script again? These filters are designed to work at 1.3 GHz. They've got N-type connectors with a raised ring on the rear mounting face that needs to be in intimate contact with the filter body so that circulating microwave currents are combined to the inside of the connector and body. I'll be machining a step in the end of the body and the end cap that's 60 micrometers less than the height of the ring on the connectors. So when I tighten the mounting screws, there'll be immense pressure on the narrow contact area, which should maintain excellent conductivity and be pretty much gas tight. I've indicated the body so it's parallel to the lathe axis and the holes coaxial with the tailstock. Using the same 6.8mm stub drill I made the hole with is a pretty good sanity check to make sure it's concentric. The workpiece isn't in contact with the chuck, so I've slipped a feeler gauge of just the right size into the gap and then measure the body length with a depth mic so I know how much to skim off. The hole needs to be 7.00mm diameter to get the right surge impedance, so I'll ream it to size. Using a reamer. Good name, it does exactly what it says on the tin. The last lathe operation on this part is making the steps around the hole for the socket body to fit against. I'm using a tiny boring bar with a CCGT060402 polished insert. Next part's the end cap. It's got identical steps to the end type socket and a raised ring that's a tight fit in the 30mm bore. The height of the step's critical as it defines the electrical length of the cavity. I wasn't impressed with using the hand scraper to deburr the socket hole in the main body, so I'm running the lathe in reverse and using the angled end of the insert to take a fine shaving off the sharp edge. I think it works! I'm using the depth mic to check the steps in the hole to make sure there's enough clearance for the collar, but that the annular ring will contact the body before the mounting flange. 
Attentive readers may notice that the workpiece suddenly became suspiciously shorter. The reason for this is one of the mysteries of the universe. I blame Parallax. Translation. Neil forgot to press the record button. A quick sanity check for the clearance using feeler gauges and all looks good. The workpiece makes a very convenient surface to align the parting tool. It's an interrupted cut so I'm using the MGMN insert which are less twitchy under impact. I'll have to change to a bladed insert as the depth of cut of the MGMN tool holder is very limited. I'll have to finish with a hacksaw anyway as the depth of cut's far too much for the 2mm blade. It's most commendable that you remembered to cover the ways to prevent the hacksaw from damaging them when you drop it. I'm suspicious about why there's so little swarf. You're looking a bit shifty, Neil. Time travellers in the room will be comforted to know that the temporal loop's now been terminated and all timelines are nominal. After flipping the part in the forge jaw, I'm tapping it down onto some parallels ready to finish it to thickness and form the locating boss. Neil is too lazy to get a gauge pin out of the box, so he's using the shank of the 7mm reamer. Which isn't quite 7mm. Sad. Yeah, I was slightly flummoxed by my inability to get the dratted thing dialed in until I realised that there was about 30 micrometres of slop and wobble. Feeling foolish, I picked a suitable gauge pin and got it spot on right away. Having been caught out previously by misaligned parts, I checked the thickness across two corners. Looks good. Hey Amy, what time is it? It's fixture time. You've been watching Kentucky Ballistics again.
this fixture makes it easy to make a run of end caps without having to align them individually. The central spigot just helps with location. The fix is done using high viscosity CA glue. I've cut grooves in the face of the fixture so I can get the glue line as thin as possible. Any excess will be squished into the grooves. Quick wipe with acetone on the faces of the fixture and the part, make sure the glue sticks nicely. This glue chuck's pretty strong, but I'll be taking small bites, especially as the facing cuts will be interrupted. Now the overall thickness is correct, I need to machine a 30mm diameter step that will engage with the main cavity body and form the transition between the 50 ohm air spaced section and the high impedance first section of the filter core. Time for a test fit. I think that'll do. Neil wishes me to point out that he has excellent fume extraction and is fully aware of the safety issues around heating cyanoacrylates. The next job is to centre the end cap and then drill, tap and counterbore the mounting holes. If you're enjoying this, or even if you aren't, please click the like button so the algorithm will think I'm not a totally rubbish YouTuber. Now it's on centre I can use the DRO pitch circle function to drill the holes in the right places. The settings for 36.7mm pitch circle diameter, which is 26mm centre to centre distance, 4 holes and starting at 45 degrees.
Astute readers may note that I'm trying the move once, change tools many times approach, as I'm normally firmly in the opposing camp. Suffice to say, I won't ever be using this method again. It's so much easier to fit a tool, leave the spindle running and whiz over to the next hole with the DRO, then change the tool on the last hole and repeat the moves. You only need three moves for subsequent tools, of course, as you're already on hole one from the fourth hole of the last tool. Also, with four holes, the moves are single axis only. It's an absolute doddle. I really should have used the tapmatic for these holes. Onwards and upwards, the next step is to drill and tap the M3 mounting holes in the open end of the body. I've squared up the body in the vise and now I'm centering the bore with the mill spindle using a dial indicator held in a collet. I don't own a reliable fly cutter, so I'm using a cheap 80mm face mill with a single polished carbide insert. Works really well, so there isn't much incentive for me to get that suburban tool copy fly cutter made. Procrastination is his middle name.
This is the underside of the part, so now I need to mill the edges of the mounting flange to the finished size. Before milling the sides I need to zero the tool height by touching the insert on one of the parallels, locking the quill and then zeroing the knee DRO axis. Now the top and bottom are milled true to each other and the transverse positions fixed by the milled faces of the flanges, I can mill the sides of the body away. I centred the DRO off camera using an edge finder. Amy, shut up. Yes, I did forget to press record. Again. All that remains to complete the body is drilling the mounting holes in the flanges and making the porthole to solder the socket at the end of the cavity. That'll be in the next episode which will be up there when I post it. Thanks for watching.